Welcome to lecture three of ECE 4305 Software Defined Radio Systems and Analysis. In this lecture, we will look at several implementation issues and design considerations when creating digital communication systems. We'll also briefly look at spectrum regulations. Engineering is all about trade-offs. Whether it's cost, speed, size, power utilization, etc. These are all common factors when performing any sort of cost-benefit analysis when attempting to design some sort of solution to a very specific problem. Digital, digital communication systems engineering is no different. Some very popular requirements that we usually need to sort of consider when performing a cost-benefit analysis and trade-off analysis are things like transmit power, data rate, probability of error, interference, cost, and form factor. However, um, as is often the case, we sometimes have conflicting requirements. For instance, we would love to keep the amount of power used in transmitting a signal to a bare minimum in order to preserve battery life. However, when we minimize the amount of transmit power, this also impacts how well or how clearly a receiver can pick up our transmission and thus that could negatively impact bit error rate. Interference and data rate, same thing. If we transmit more information, um, so we would love to transmit as much information in per unit time as possible, but um, those uh, rapid fluctuations in the transmission waveform can give rise to interference issues. Finally, um, we all love having smaller, uh, more compact uh, wireless platforms that we can fit in almost everything. Instead of something that we can lug on our back, we would love to have something as slick and uh, small as, let's say, a smartphone with a lot of advanced functionality that uh, barely weighs anything uh, attached to our belts. On, uh, however, um, such a form factor comes at, at, at a direct expense or cost, where um, you have to pay in order to have uh, such an advanced design. So in this course, uh, we'll be taking into consideration many of these uh, requirements when implementing our own digital communication systems. One very important concept that comes up in uh, software-defined radio and digital communication systems when we implement them is this concept called faster than real time. So what does this mean, faster than real time? Well. Uh, remember what, what I mentioned several lectures ago about the bottleneck being the analog to digital and digital analog converter for any software defined radio platform, right? Remember the interface between the analog world and the digital world is how quickly we can convert or map bits and binary uh, and digital information to analog waveforms and vice versa. Okay. Well, so th really the quality of our software-defined radio platform will be dictated by how well our analog to digital and digital analog converter performs in terms of the number of samples that it can generate or produce or handle per unit time. We also, so, so one key factor uh, for the analog to digital and digital analog converter that uh, anybody who's looking at a software-defined radio platform needs to take into consideration is something called its sampling rate. Okay. So on, as I mentioned before about the USRP N210, uh, the analog to digital converter has a sampling rate of 400 megasamples per second. So we'll, we'll be looking at that number several times more throughout this course. At the same time, the digital to analog converter sampling rate for the USRP N210 is 100 mega samples per second. Okay. What faster than real time means is that our processing system, like uh, in this case, um, the computer host that is doing all the baseband functionality and processing, um, its processor speed is probably much faster than that of the sampling rate of the analog digital and digital analog converter of this um, USRP N210 platform, which is great because every time a sample comes into the, US, uh, into the USRP or from the USRP, what we can do is in between received samples, we can execute multiple clock cycles of whatever sort of microprocessor system that you're using in order to treat that sample, such as equalization. So as a result, 
by the time the next sample arrives or needs to be dealt with, the previous sample has already been treated by whatever sort of baseband processing we have at the computer host. So it gives the illusion that our communication system is operating in real time. There is no lag or latency due to processing every sample. Basically, as quickly as the samples come in, they're treated before the next sample arrives. And this is quite important if you want to have some sort of real-time functionality for your communication system. Another design consideration that we need to look at when dealing with uh, the implementation of digital communication systems is battery life. And um, we might not think of it uh, right away because, uh, for instance, like in, our, in this course, we'll be uh, dealing with computer hosts which have a sort of a guaranteed power supply. They plug into a wall and unless there's a blackout in the building, um, uh, that, that power supply is pretty much uh, insured. But suppose you want to design a communication system or a software-defined radio that has a finite power supply, like a battery pack attached to it. In this case, we'll need to be very mindful of what sort of design we're implementing on our software-defined radio. Uh, computationally powerful implementations, like very complex algorithms, um, um, uh, uh, the processing of very high data rates, uh, all of these are very, um, very power consuming, especially when you have your processing device churning away, trying to handle all that information in unit time. So um, as a result, uh, there is energy that's being expended by this process, in, as well as if you also transmit at high power at the transmitter, what ends up happening is you're expending energy that way, trying to broadcast your analog waveforms over the air. So all of these will impact your finite power supply that's attached to your software-defined radio device. Sadly, unlike the microelectronics industry, which you know has witnessed significant advances over the last several decades, battery technology has not progressed as much as the microelectronics industry. As a result, um, instead of designing new batteries that can be more power, uh, you know, provide more power within the same form factor um, and, 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 and last longer and such, uh, we've got to be smarter when designing our software-defined radio given this limitation on power. Okay. So as a result, um, we need to take into consideration techniques that can minimize the transmit power. Do we really need to transmit that much energy by the antenna in order to get our signal across to an intended receiver, or can we minimize that? Our choice of microprocessor system. Do we really need an FPGA or a computer host, or can we use something that's very power efficient, like a digital processor? The number of computations per operation. Can we somehow minimize the complexity, computational complexity of various operations that are being performed by the digital processor at the, for the baseline functionality of our radio? And finally, do we really need to transmit that much information? Because what ends up happening is uh, we're expending energy per bit of information that's sent over the air. Can we minimize that uh, somehow? And that's where source encoding comes in very useful because with source encoding, we can remove a lot of that redundant information prior to transmission. What's kind of useful is that a lot of T today's wireless mobile devices have built-in power monitors. So that's a great sort of way of gauging, um, uh, especially if you do try and target power minimization, power, uh, minimize power utilization for your SDR platform or your wireless device or your communication system um, by observing um, how your, your process is, uh, is, is operating in terms of expending energy. Yet another issue is interoperability, and this is where software-defined radio really has a niche. Um, interoperability, in today's world, we have a plethora of wireless standards. We don't have just one standard, we usually have multiple wireless standards, uh, cellular standards, um, wireless local area network standards, um, standards for personal area networks, um, uh, different uh, standards for public safety community uh, communications, for military, for police, for firefighters, emergency services, uh, the like. Um, however, unfortunately, a lot of these standards are usually not uh, cannot communicate with one another. So a police officer may not be able to communicate with a firefighter who may not be able to communicate with an ambulance 
um, or, and, and so on and so forth. So as a result, in situations where uh, we lack any sort of like centralized control or conversion between one standard and another, you usually have like a Tower of Babel type of scenario. And this is, uh, becomes quite acute in emer emergency and disaster relief operations where uh, centralized wireless infrastructure is missing and you have several different communities trying to work together, uh, communications usually breaks down unless there's a plan and systems for performing interoperability between them. And, and this has been uh, made apparent by a variety of scenarios, including Hurricane Katrina, which uh, affected New Orleans and its disaster relief efforts, as well as Hurricane Sandy. Okay, so now that we looked at a variety of different types of uh, uh, implementation issues and design considerations, let's focus on one particular aspect that everyone who transmits over the air needs to know about, which is spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum. So whenever I talk about frequency or channels or bands, what I'm talking about is <clears throat> the electromagnetic frequency or spectrum that my wireless signal, once it leaves a transmitter, occupies it within a specific region and that a receiver is trying to tune into in order to pick it off the air in order to convert it back into digital data. And so in, and so in this case, what we have is uh, we need to understand how wireless spectrum is allocated in terms of like, you know, how it's managed, how is it being used, and all the issues associated with it because what happens is more and more, especially in today's world, uh, the amount of available wireless spectrum in order to, let's say, carry out your own wireless transmission is becoming increasingly scarce. So the bottom line is, if you have one, more than one transmitter within any area, you automatically have some sort of electromagnetic interference. Because what happens is, when you transmit a signal, it's not confined to a specific band. It's not confined between uh, 2.45 and 2.46 gigahertz. It essentially produces emissions that spread from minus infinity to infinity in the frequency domain. So what we need to do is, we need to figure out, like first of all, how does this electromagnetic spectrum of our signals behave? and how to minimize its impact on other transmissions. Because the last thing you want to do is interfere with anyone else because then, um, you know, bad things happen. Especially if it's a licensed transmission, you can get into some serious trouble with um, uh, federal regulators. And, and, and you might wonder, well, if spectrum spreads from minus infinity to infinity, why should I be worried about interfering with anybody who would be clo uh, operating close to my, my transmission frequency. Well, the thing is, although there might be an infinite amount of electromagnetic spectrum out there, um, not all spectrum is good spectrum in terms of accommodating a wireless transmission. In fact, there's a prime spectrum real estate from, z from DC, zero hertz, to up to three gigahertz. That's the, that's the range of electromagnetic spectrum that is suitable for wireless communications. It's got great propagation characteristics. You can design uh, wireless transceivers rather cheaply if they're operating in that frequency range. So a, almost a good majority of today's wireless applications operate within that frequency range. And that's where we're getting the spectral congestion that we need to be concerned about. So the question is, who is taking care of in, uh, putting in the rules and regulations? Who, who's monitoring? Who's refereeing that wireless spectrum? Who's making sure people are playing nice in that wireless spectrum? And the answer is the federal government. Depending on which country you're in, um, the, the federal government of that country is ultimately responsible for the allocation, licensing, monitoring, and enforcement of spectrum regulations to ensure that the spectrum is, um, may, is, is, uh, is efficiently used and people are not interfering with each other, or at least that interference is kept to a minimum, okay? 
The reason why the federal government is involved is that electromagnetic spectrum, whether you realize it or not, is actually a natural resource, just like gold, just like water, just like oil, and therefore this falls under uh, their jurisdiction. So depending on where you are in the world, so if you're in the United States, there's the Federal Communications Commission for non-federal agencies, and uh, the NTIA, which is part of the Department of Commerce for federal agencies, and these two organizations, which are part of the, the federal government of the United States, um, are responsible for sp uh, spectrum regulation and enforcement and monitoring uh, in this country. Uh, for Canada, uh, Industry Canada is the f uh, federal organization that handles uh, spectrum regulation in that country. Uh, Ofcom in the United Kingdom and Comreg in Ireland are similar entities. And pretty much every country in the world has an organization um, within the federal government that handles spectrum regulation. So uh, why do we need uh, uh, spectrum regulations? Well, the problem comes down to as this. Um, essentially, uh, there are going to be a lot, of a lot of electrical devices out there that will produce electromagnetic emissions. So we're not only talking about wireless devices, we're talking about any electrical appliance. And so therefore, there needs to be some sort of emissions and compliance testing to ensure that that device is not going to interfere with everyone around. It basically follows regulations imposed by the federal regulator. And because in a lot of cases, a lot of these um, devices that are producing uh, electromagnetic emissions um, they're not coordinated. Like one guy might not know of the existence of the other guy, but when they start transmitting or they're operating and emissions are flying all over the place and begin interfering with each other, well, then you, they will definitely know that something's up and they need some sort of way of regulating or ensuring that everybody has some sort of access to spectrum in a way that, um, that minimizes interference with everyone else. So some of the ways that spectrum regulators sort of impose rules on different frequency bands in different regions of the country um, are things like allowable transmit power levels and frequency masks of your emissions. So if you transmit uh, a signal, how it looks like in frequency, you might be required to fit it underneath what they call a frequency mask. And we'll be looking at this later on in the course. Even things like the detection threshold for classifying the presence of uh, a signal or the lack of a signal is important like you know what what is what is what is a, a reasonable power level uh, to, uh, to consider if let's say I'm looking at a, a frequency band um, how do I know that there's actually a signal there or not and and so there are a variety of different thresholds that would tell me whether there's a signal present or not in that signal in that spectrum so two key issues with uh, spectrum are as follows. The first one is out-of-band emissions, or OOB. And OOB um, is a very serious issue. This is when you have your transmission, you're given a specific band to operate across, but you don't design your communication system appropriately, and what happens is you produce electromagnetic em emissions that you may not be aware of that are occurring outside your allocation, your frequency band that you're allowed to transmit across, and you're interfering with everyone around you. And so this is a very challenging problem, and there are a variety of different OOB mitigation techniques out there that can be used in order to minimize interference out of band. Because what happens is, suppose there's somebody in the adjacent frequency band next to your transmission they would be interfered with and therefore you're negatively affecting the coexistence of other signals operating in your frequency vicinity. The second issue is the hidden node problem. Um, in a lot of cases we might have uh, electro, uh, like electrical devices or wireless communication systems that have no mechanism for coordinating with each other. And as a result, uh, two or more devices might be using the same wireless frequency at the same time um, uh, and, and be interfering with each other, and they have no way of trying to sort of negotiate out of this, this, this unfortunate situation. So essentially, suppose I'm transmitting and there's an, 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 on a particular frequency and uh, to a particular receiver, and there's another receiver that has no way of communicating with me that I'm interfering with that, with, with that device, 
As a result, that device is the hidden node. It has, I have no way of knowing its presence, and I'm unintentionally interfering with it. And this is a huge problem, and in fact, um, it's still an unsolved problem, and it's a great graduate research thesis topic um, if you choose to pursue one. So let's look at these two issues in a little bit more detail. So the first issue, the out-of-band interference, okay? So OOB interference. What do I mean by this? So suppose we have something in the frequency domain, F, okay? And you are allocated this frequency, band, F1 to F2. So those are the limits of your band. And so you design your signal and it looks like, like this. Okay, great, huh? So that's your transmission that you're transmitting over the air. Ideally, that would be wonderful. Nicely confined, doesn't spill over anywhere. Um, it's very nicely contained. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, our signals do propagate outside our allocated bandwidth. And so that is your OOB. And unfortunately, there might be another transmission. So let's say that's a neighboring transmission. And this OOB here could be negatively impacting the signal reception of that transmission at its receiver. So what the um, uh, folks like the FCC and other spectrum regulators do is um, they usually provide specifications on how your transmission should look like and by putting something called a tra uh, spectral mask. So it looks something like this and then over frequency, it defines what the maximum power level should be like. So already this guy is not compliant to the spectrum spectral mask that has been specified by the uh, FCC or spectrum regulator. So you'll need to design your, your digital communication system in order to have its frequency response, its spectrum, fit underneath that mask and and the neighboring transmission knows it so it will know that it will have some interference coming over but it will be limited and and it can be provisioned in its transmission so it can adjust its power level or it can design um, various types of uh, channel encoding schemes and modulation schemes in order to mitigate as much as possible that interference coming from um, from your transmission as long as it knows that you will not be exceeding that mask as for the hidden node problem, here's a better example. So suppose there I am, that's my transmitter. Here's a receiver that I want to trans transmit to. So I just send my signal across over the air on channel, let's say on frequency F1. Now, suppose there's another receiver other that is also expecting to hear something on F1, but not my signal, right? Someone else, like there's another transmitter over here, other. Uh, what happens is suppose this receiver has absolutely no way of communicating to me or my friend at the receiver here, whether that, that in fact, I'm actually interfering with him. As a result, we call this guy here a hidden node. And this is a very serious problem, especially when we have um, areas where there's a dense, uh, dense population 
um, and lots of wireless transmitters everywhere using the same frequencies. Um, imagine office buildings where you have multiple Wi-Fi devices or uh, other sort of wireless communication systems, like uh, lots of people, lots of devices in a very small space. The issues of having uh, interference is quite large. And as a result, a hidden node, like let's say a Wi-Fi device, has uh, if it, suppose theoretically you have a Wi-Fi uh, device and it's operating at the same frequency as a cellular uh, system, uh, what ends up happening is that uh, those two standards don't interoperate with each other, don't communicate with each other, and as a result, one will be unintentionally interfered with by the other. So this is definitely um, an area of uh, rich research potential, and, it, and, and so if you can come up with a solution for this, uh, um, that would be uh, that would resolve a lot of um, uh, issues nowadays with respect to multiple wireless um, transmissions uh, operating close vicinity to each other and potentially interfering with each other.